Revenge is a tough subject. Uh, as Kay was talking in her children's sermon, I wasn't sure if you were going to start with forgiveness, but you started with revenge. And it's always something about paying somebody back for something they did, and not in a good way. And I've had some conversations with people over the last few weeks, especially about social media, where people have, others have made comments on their own Facebook pages about, you know, how horrible that person is and that would have been better that person was never born and and these are horrible things that people are saying and these are strangers that don't even know who the who the individual is and it's it's really troubling that you know of course you can sit in the comfort of your own little living room and and write horrible things to somebody that you don't know and that's just one one uh example of things that people do that you would think that you would want to get back at them for. And, and as I've been thinking about these troubling things and just the way people treat each other in general these days, it seems there's not a lot of human decency. Uh, I was trying hard for a couple of days to think about a time when I wanted to get somebody back, pay someone back for something bad that they did. I know that I've been angry, there's been times I've been resentful, but I couldn't think, I guess I'm not that vindictive a person, because I couldn't think of a time when I really wanted revenge. The only, I think the worst revenge, if you want to say revenge, I've ever been involved in was out pranking someone else who played a prank on me. And it was never a prank that was malicious or mean, because I always thought the most sly, wily, funny prank you can pull on someone is it's not hurtful it's just wow how did you pull that off and we used to do that at Silver Lake a lot we used to do that at camp so some of you out there know <laughs> know what I'm capable of but it's never mean-spirited it's usually something that just can make you laugh well the Bible on the other hand is full of people who are who want to seek revenge it's why I think Jesus worked really hard to negate the literal justice system that was established in Leviticus when he said, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. And it doesn't mean you should lay down and take it, but I think the message kind of shed some light back onto the story of Joseph. And as Kay said, if anybody would be entitled to some payback, it would be Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his own jealous brothers. I mean, that's bad enough. But if we step back and look at Joseph's story, and I know we jumped from him being sold into slavery to him, all of a sudden meeting with his brothers here, we've skipped over all the drama that has gone on and how he has persevered. But Joseph's story is unique in many ways. And one of those ways, it's not, one of the ways it's not unique, is that it's kind of like the book of Esther, where you don't see the active presence of Yahweh stepping in. Now, like, for Moses, Moses talked to God all the time on the mountaintop. You know, it's, he probably talked to him in his sleep. But God, Moses was always talking to Yahweh, but not Joseph. Joseph, throughout his life, since we met him with his technicolor dream coat and being sold into slavery, he somehow finds a way to thrive. He's down in a pit awaiting his fate and then he ends up in a foreign household as a servant. And then he's in a foreign prison. And then he's before the royal court of Pharaoh. And then there's some other intrigues that happen in there where his dreams, his visions uh, take part and help him out of certain situations to get him to where he is today. So throughout that time throughout his life he's had fears and frustrations and moments of weeping and despite that or maybe as a result of that joseph has risen from a foreigner to a position of leadership over all of egypt which 
it just seems mind-boggling to me. And so when all of a sudden there's a famine in the land, and this is another situation where we don't really see God at work, but usually famine is a signal that God is going to send some sort of a savior. <laughs> so here we have the brothers going to Egypt, not knowing that their brother is there, looking for help because there's famine in the land. And that moment arises and the boys, the men, are brought before this man, this Lord of Egypt, to find out a judgment Joseph sees that it's his brothers. And he's so overwhelmed that he kicks everybody out of the room that's not related to him. And he cries. Not only does he cry, he wails. He weeps. And not only do his brothers hear it, the whole household of Pharaoh hears it. So in that moment, faced with his brothers, whom he had once loved, Joseph's life, I think Joseph's life flashed before him. Everything he had gone through, the dreams and the visions that he'd had, literally. And so instead of in that moment, with all the power that he had, he didn't hold a grudge. He didn't send his, sentence his brothers and the rest of his family to death by famine. Joseph has this all-seeing moment where he realizes that God has been with him all along. Not that God made things happen, but that God was present in his choices. God was right there, and God is right then in the possibility of a family restored. We can hear in Joseph's actions, the echoes of Yahweh's voice speaking to Israel, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. And those are some of the words that Jesus, I mean, that Joseph, it's very close, same thing, <laughs> almost the same name, uh, says to his brothers, Bring your families and your children and your children's children so that they may live. So though the Hebrew Bible is filled with a lot of revenge seekers, through Joseph we witness the true nature of God, that love wins out. Mercy is the result. Forgiveness is possible. And in all of that is life. These days we need that reminder more and more. We're stretched by the COVID distancing and the hot weather. We see more and more hatred and bigotry, whether it's on the news or, like I said, in social media or even in our own lives. As it was for Joseph, we have to, maybe we, we need to just pause for that moment and recognize that God is with us in all times, in all places, in all the years. Take some time to be kind to yourself and think about all that you've been through, all that you've made it through, and see where you are right now. Maybe you'd be able to see it in the light that Joseph saw, not as a lifetime filled with people who did things to you and resentments, but of things that you've overcome and the possibilities that you've lived into. Maybe you'll see in your so, so yourself all that Joseph did, and you might find yourself having that wailing moment because sometimes we do need to cry out loud for the sadness, for the joy. And maybe that crying out loud is a catharsis. Maybe that's what that was for Joseph, a cathartic moment. Everything came to one crystallizing vision. And that gut-wrenching wail 
was a man manifestation of a profound transformation in Joseph. And maybe we should look for moments like that in our lives. And they will help us remember that with God, love wins out, that mercy is possible, forgiveness can happen, and in all of it is life.